I was to say good afternoon, but it, we're actually moving into good evening. Um, I have the pleasure of welcoming back our Assistant Secretary for the Bureau of African Affairs, Linda Thomas Greenfield, to the Foreign Press Center today. Uh, thank you all for coming. Thank. Uh, Assistant Secretary Tom Greenfield for coming today. Um, she's going to give a little overview about some of the discussions she had during this week, and then we'd be happy to take your questions. When you um, ask your question, can you just give your name and media affiliation? And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Good. Thank you very much, and, uh, and welcome. Uh, let me just say that I've had a very productive week. As you can see, my voice is uh, cracking a, a little bit. That's from all the hot air. Uh, that has been going around New York, all the meetings and all of uh, the discussions. What is useful for all of us uh, when we come to New York during this week is that we have the opportunity to meet and engage with a large uh, number of African leaders and uh, as well those who uh, work on African issues. Uh, for us, this was an extraordinary week for uh, many reasons. As you know, the president hosted the second Africa, U.S. Africa Business Forum, uh, which brought African leaders, U.S. CEOs, and African CEOs together for a full day of engagement uh, to talk about opportunities for doing business on the continent of Africa. The president also hosted the Leaders Summit on Refugees, uh, which uh, was um, in which Ethiopia was one of uh, the co-host and six African countries, and I may not have that number exactly correct, uh, made new commitments to uh, supporting uh, refugees. Uh, Africa has a, uh, a significant number of refugees. African countries have b always been incredibly hospitable hosts to refugees. And uh, for us, it was uh, a, an extraordinary commitment for these countries to make new commitments for uh, refugees to provide uh, livelihood f uh, for them and uh, educational opportunities for refugees that live uh, in their countries. Uh, we also use this week to highlight our concerns about the ongoing situation in South Sudan, uh, the situation in Burundi, uh, to continue to move forward the agenda to move toward uh, an electoral process in Somalia, and as well to discuss the uh, current and ongoing situation uh, in Gabon. I could go on and on because there were a number of other uh, uh, issues and situ situations as well. Uh, but again, it was an extraordinary opportunity uh, to uh, look at the priorities that we have working in Africa and to engage with others with similar priorities and similar concerns. So I welcome your questions. Yes. I'm Pente from uh, Voice of America. So if you could tell us uh, which African countries and in what way that you have agreed to cooperate in terms of refugee assistance uh, with these countries. Uh, you know, we have, um, and I would save this question and tell you to ask the refugee, uh, our Office of Population, Refugees and Migration, but I have a long um, uh, history and career uh, working those issues as well. I don't know all the current details, but we have a long history of working with Africa on refugee issues. And uh, as the president noted in his speech, uh, the U.S. is the largest donor uh, to refugee programs across the globe. Uh, we are a significant supporter of UNHCR, of the ICRC, of the World Food Program, of all the UN agencies, as well as NGOs that are working in refugee camps and on humanitarian uh, situations. Uh, I can't give you the exact dollar figure, but if you uh, pull it all together, you'll see that the U.S. is always there, and we're always there uh, with significant uh, funding. The United States had a bilateral meeting with Nigeria, uh, I think, a couple of days ago. Uh, can you uh, tell us a little bit more about what was discussed? I'm particularly interested in uh, the issue of security cooperation, because that's been a sore point, I know, in the past. Uh, we, we have a very strong bilateral relationship with Nigeria that we hope to continue to, to strengthen. Uh, we want to help uh, Nigeria address the uh, security challenges that they are facing. Uh, from Boko Haram in the Northeast and 
uh, for uh, in dealing with the situation that they're dealing with in the Niger Delta, uh, with the pipelines being broken, kidnappings taking place. Uh, Nigeria is really for us a pillar on the continent of Africa, and uh, Nigeria's success will or failure will impinge upon its neighbors. So we have engaged with the Nigerians on how we can better assist them in the area of uh, security. Uh, we have also discussed efforts to support uh, their uh, efforts to improve their economy. And uh, the president, President Buhari, indicated very early in his tenure when he came to the United States right after he was elected that he wanted to address the issue of corruption. So we engage with, uh, with him on that issue as well and how uh, our various agencies that are involved in, uh, in that area can uh, provide better assistance to them. Uh, I'm Dulce Leinbach from Pass Blue. So on the uh, economic situation in Nigeria, what did you discuss? Because the price of oil, of course, is dropping. Well, percent. that's the gist of it. Uh, President Buhari noted that uh, at a point Nigeria was getting $100 a barrel for oil, and we know that that price has gone down uh, significantly. I think it's around uh, $40 a barrel. Don't quote me on the exact figures because it's, it, it's waffled uh, back and forth. But uh, I think it suffices to say that the price of oil, a uh, barrel of oil, dropped more than 50 percent over a, a period of time. And that has had a significant impact on Nigeria's economy that is almost based exclusively on uh, the revenue that it gets from oil. Uh, Buhari indicated that he would like uh, Nigeria to diversify its uh, uh, its economy. Uh, he'd like to focus attention on agribusiness, and he asked for our support in that area. And we offered uh, support through uh, USAID uh, to support their efforts to uh, ramp up and and rebuild their agricultural sector. Uh, we talked about the possibility of new investments in. Uh, Nigeria, bringing new companies uh, outside of the oil business, and what is needed uh, in Nigeria uh, to attract new investments. Uh, President Buhari, as you know, participated in the um, uh, Africa Business Forum. Uh, in fact, he's, he was one of the speakers at the forum, and uh, he, uh, I think, provided a very strong speech uh, that was very encouraging to the, to the private sector, indicating that he was prepared to uh, look at uh, Nigeria's um, business environment and see what changes would be needed to attract more companies to, uh, uh, to Nigeria. And of course, we know corruption is a huge concern for, uh, for companies doing business in Nigeria. And his efforts to address it, I think, are important. Yes, sir. Thank you. Uh, Sherman Bryce, Peace South African Broadcasting. I wonder if you've met with the DRC foreign minister who's speaking across the way in, in, in a short time. And what is the United States reading of what is going on in the DRC, particularly in light of the consideration around sanctions that we're seeing reports of? Uh, we're uh, very worried about what we see happening uh, in DRC. We did have a, a meeting with the uh, foreign minister. Um, I was not there in the meeting, but uh, one of our uh, principals uh, met with him along with our special envoy uh, for the Great Lakes. Uh, we expressed our concerns about the breakdown in, in the dialogue recently that led to the violence that we witnessed uh, this week uh, in the DRC. Uh, we think that President Kabila has a historic opportunity to transition uh, for the first time, uh, the Democratic Republic of Congo, uh, from one uh, elected head of state uh, to a, a second elected head of state. And that's a big deal. And that would be, I think, an extraordinary legacy for, uh, for him. Uh, they, uh, the government of DRC needs to open up the dialogue. It has to be an inclusive dialogue. And it has to take into account uh, the uh, concerns of, uh, of the parties who would be participating in the election. And I think it's possible. Uh, we have not lost uh, hope 
Uh, we're still hopeful that they can get there. But in the meantime, we have imposed some sanctions on individuals who have been involved in, in violence, uh, in intimidation, and those who have uh, done things to harm the hum human rights of people who, who are protesting. Uh, we do believe that people have the right to, uh, to demonstrate, uh, but nonviolently, and we've called on all the parties to uh, uh, show restraint and not um, participate in any violent acts either against the government or the government against demonstrators. Room in terms of the election date, in terms of the constitution, it needs to happen by before the end of the year. Are you willing to? You no, know, it's not our decision uh, to to uh, determine when the election should be. Uh, what we know is that uh, in the dialogue, there were discussions about uh, the date of the election. I think we all agree uh, that, given the very tight time frame that we're under right now. Uh, that it's going to be difficult to hold elections by uh, December 17th. But it's not, that's not a decision for, for us to make. It's a decision for all the parties to make. Uh, I understand in the most recent uh, dialogue uh, that they've agreed on some, uh, some dates, but the date that was announced by the government of uh, having elections in 2018 uh, was not uh, acceptable to, to the opposition. Service. Well, if they have an election, will we have observers? Yeah. You know, I suspect that we will. Uh, there are very few um, elections where we don't have, uh, at minimum, our embassy. And, um, and uh, usually we will have people come in from Washington. We have funded NDI and IRI and Carter Center uh, to do observations in uh, uh, different elections. So uh, given the uh, extent uh, the concerns about these elections, I would uh, expect that we would have observers here. Yes, sir. Yeah, we were about Carlos State. Just following with uh, my uh, brother question. Uh, you mentioned here, you talk about the dialogue, but we know in the Congo, uh, the major opposition party are not represented to, uh, to that dialogue. We, we talk about Mr. Katumbi, Chisikedi, and all the other people. So what is the United States doing to, in terms of pushing them to get to, together? Um, we are Another encouraging thing? them. Let, let me answer that, because uh, that's a key point. Uh, in order for the dialogue to be inclusive, all the parties have to be present. And uh, we have encouraged uh, these two major uh, uh, opposition party leaders uh, to uh, participate in, in the dialogue process. And we're urging them every opportunity uh, that uh, we have that they should be part of this process. They can't sit on the sidelines and allow for a process to take place that they're not part of. Uh, so, yes, to your question, are we urging them? Uh, just a comment about the uh, recent incident with uh, Mr. Perriero at the airport. Mm -hmm. Do you have any comment about it? We were disappointed. Uh, and, and my view is if such a thing would happen to the Secretary of State's special envoy, uh, I don't know what happens to people who don't have the backing of the U.S. government behind yeah, them. Yeah. So we have pro protested that uh, to the uh, to the government. To the United States, any strong message to the government? We have done that. Yes, sir. Uh, I'm Mike Flesch, and I'm with Sahara Reporters. I got to do that the first time. Uh, I'd like to take it back to Nigeria, if I could. Two questions. Uh, the first is a follow-up on uh, the bilateral and the question of military assistance. Um, in the past, uh, the Leahy Law, which imposes restrictions on U.S. military assistance to countries and military units uh, with human rights issues, has been one obstacle to U.S.-Nigerian military cooperation. Uh, is the administration now satisfied that that obstacle has been addressed and is no longer an issue? And were specific types of uh, equipment raised? I know the Nigerians have been looking for light attack aircraft for a couple of years now. Uh, so was that raised? Were there any commitments? My, my second question is, is on the economic relationship. Uh, some years back, the United States bought a million barrels of Nigerian oil a day. 
Uh, I think last year the U.S. bought about five or 6,000 barrels. Mm -hmm. uh, so effectively, the U.S. no longer buys Nigerian oil. Mm -hmm. And that, of course, has, has impacted in its own way on the Nigerian economy. Have, was there any discussions about trying to ramp up market access for Nigerian oil in the United States? Uh, first, on, on Leahy and security assistance, we continue to work with the Nigerian military and security services to address our Leahy concerns. Uh, there are still concerns, uh, and we have worked to address these, and the Nigerians are aware of, of our uh, concerns in that area. So we're not fully 100% uh, uh, where we need to be. Uh, but we are working to uh, improve their uh, conduct uh, as it relates to the um, how they deal with their, their own population uh, and to uh, try to ensure that uh, they do not commit uh, human rights violations uh, when they are addressing and, and dealing with the situation, uh, uh, fighting Boko Haram. Uh, so this is an ongoing thing uh, that I think will continue to uh, uh, be an issue. Uh, the main concern is that people be held accountable uh, if they uh, if they commit such acts, and uh, the Nigerians are very much aware of that. We did have some discussions on uh, what kinds of uh, assistance we can provide uh, to the Nigerians. Uh, the president said to us, uh, Bahari, that uh, he wasn't going to give us a, a shopping list, uh, but we have been uh, looking at uh, providing. Uh, some um, um, air support uh, uh, helicopters to them, and we've been working on that with them for uh, for some time. On uh, market, you know, um, the U.S. is its own producer of oil. I'm not an expert on this, but I think we're at a point where uh, uh, we we are getting a significant portion of the oil that we need uh, that we might have purchased from Nigeria from our own uh, resources. But the market is huge. And Nigeria is not meeting uh, its uh, minimum requirements under their allocation uh, for OPIC. So they can do a lot more uh, to uh, raise their production levels. And uh, the market is there for them, whether it's the, the United States or, or it's elsewhere in the world. So on the repatriation of Somali uh, refugees living in northern Kenya, uh, experts fear that uh, uh, a huge uh, repatriation of, uh, of people who've lived in northern Kenya for a number of years might create uh, resource uh, competition and um, refuel some of the conflict that, that was existing. Land is an issue. So what is being done in terms of uh, making sure that the repatriation does not under international standards, repatriation must be voluntary. Uh, and we have uh, engaged very intensely with the Kenyan government uh, to ensure that they honor their obligations under international humanitarian law uh, and that no refugee who does not feel safe to go home uh, is forced uh, across the border. Uh, the government of Kenya, UNHCR, and the government of Somalia have signed a tripartite agreement in which they are working to develop a repatriation strategy uh, that will allow people to return home voluntarily and safely. Uh, so, you know, it, everywhere in the world, unfortunately, uh, when countries start to have problems, they point their finger at refugees. They point their fingers at migrants and um, and um, and people who they think are taking away from uh, their country. Uh, I was really, um, um, you know, I worked in Kenya as the refugee coordinator. Uh, Kenya uh, has been an incredible host uh, to uh, to refugees. I was there in the 90s. Uh, many of the Somali refugees have been there more than 20 years. Many of them were born in the refugee camp. Nobody wants to live their entire lives in a refugee camp. So I know that when the time is right uh, and the situation is uh, secure inside of Somalia, that these refugees will want to go home. And that's what we're working uh, to do uh, right now uh, in terms of the political process inside of uh, Somalia. 
uh, working to ensure that they have a political process that leads to uh, a new government in the coming uh, in the coming months. Uh, but also, uh, we're working with AMISOM and with the troop contributing countries to, to AMISOM uh, to address the uh, insecurity and the instability that Al Shabaab has uh, caused in uh, in Somalia, particularly uh, in the areas where uh, re refugees uh, are from. So again, I think this is something that's a work in progress. Uh, we hear a lot of rhetoric, but ultimately humanitarian uh, standards are, are generally honored. How about creating uh, economic opportunities for Somalis returning back to yeah, their They have to have that. Uh, they have to have education. They have to have uh, economic opportunities. They have to have development. You don't just bring them back across the border and, and dump them, and particularly in situations where uh, land uh, rights are, 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 are an issue. Uh, so those are things that are part of what we are working on. Uh, they have to be part of rebuilding, though. Uh, it's not going to happen while they're on the Kenya side of the border and be there waiting for them when they return. They have to be part of that rebuilding uh, process. Yes. Hi, Temi Oshikoya, Africa Bazaar Magazine. Um, I'm, regarding trade, what is the, I know the U.S. is working with various African countries. Uh, what is the U.S. doing to support and improve our regional trade within Africa? Uh, that's a great question. It gives me an opportunity to talk about something I hadn't talked about, and that's Trade Africa, okay. uh, which is one of the initiatives that came out of the Africa Leaders Summit in 2014. Uh, the initial idea of Trade Africa was to encourage uh, more robust trade between the countries of East Africa, but we have broadened that to include other countries. There are huge markets just across the border, so sometimes we talk about how to improve trade between Africa and the United States and Africa and Europe, when in fact there are markets right next door. Uh, and uh, what is needed to encourage those markets are um, customs uh, agreements, um, open borders, uh, open immigration between these countries, and infrastructure, which during the Leaders' Summit, uh, there were uh, a couple of surveys done, and infrastructure was listed as the top uh, requirement for investments to take place uh, on the continent of Africa. And what that means are having better roads and bridges between, uh, between countries so that trade can be uh, uh, supported and encouraged. Yes, sir. There's, there's a great deal of concern in Africa about the future. Um, and, and, and that's possible, not, a, glo that's a, possible not a global concern. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, in relation to the United <laughs> States and, really? and the upcoming election, uh, <laughs> and, and what a, a Trump presidency could mean for your relations with Africa, um, the protectionist rhetoric that emanates from the Republican uh, campaign. Now, I know you, that you're an Obama uh, appointee, but I wonder if that this, this issue comes up in your bilaterals and, and what your response to. You know, it comes up all the time. Uh, and uh, while I was appointed to this position uh, by President Obama, I'm a career officer, and uh, I have uh, had appointments uh, from uh, President uh, Bush as well when I was the ambassador to Liberia. I um, I am always optimistic. And the one thing that I think is important uh, is the fact that Africa has always been bipartisan. Uh, the support for Africa on the Hill, uh, it's Democrats and Republicans. You go on either side of the aisle, uh, we, we get tremendous support. And uh, I think uh, any new administration coming in will see the opportunities. Uh, Africa is kind of the last frontier, and there are peop th those opportunities are going to be there. And it is the private sector that will uh, be the driver of uh, opportunities for investment uh, on the continent of Africa, and they will engage with policymakers to ensure that our policies support that. So I don't see that there will be any significant diminishment of our commitment to continue to work on the continent of Africa, there will be differences in style. Uh, there will be differences in focus. 
uh, and priorities, and there will be new initiatives. Uh, but I, I dare say that uh, when we look at the initiatives that are important to Africa, they cross party lines. When you go back to AGOA that was uh, uh, started under the Clinton administration, it was extended under uh, the um, Bush administration and extended again uh, for 10 years under the Obama administration. Uh, if we look at PEPFAR, uh, PEPFAR has gone to the next level having been started under the Bush administration and extended uh, under, uh, under the Obama administration. And I see many of the initiatives that we have started uh, under uh, the Obama administration. I see many of those initiatives continuing. I see YALI continuing. I see Power Africa, which has been uh, uh, codified in legislation under Electrify Africa. These are initiatives that will continue on the continent of Africa. And then the other part of our Africa policy, we have a huge Africa diaspora. No, sometimes people compare mm -hmm. us to other countries in the world. Uh, you don't hear about an Africa diaspora in China. Uh, we, we have uh, people from every country on the continent of Africa who are Americans. Uh, they're hyphenated Americans, and they will continue to advocate for policies that uh, will enrich the relationship that we have with the continent of Africa. So, yes. Okay. <laughs> President, pre President Obama in Africa said, uh, Africa doesn't need a strong man, but they need a strong institution. But when you look at Africa, it seems to go to the, the, the opposite direction. You see what happened in Burundi, in Rwanda, they changed the constitution and the, it, all the Congos. Uh, and the President is, Obama is about to leave the, uh, the office. Is he disappointed? Are you <laughs> disappointed? No, I'm not disappointed. Uh, because you guys report all the bad news. You guys report about the guys who stay in, in office forever. You're not reporting the great news that uh, <laughs> Cote d'Ivoire, a country that was almost in war, had uh, a second election that uh, went extraordinarily well. You're not reporting on uh, Senegal. Uh, where there were great elections. You've forgotten that Nigeria, for the first time in history, had a change of power from a ruling party that had been in power for a long time and elected the opposition candidate in what was a free and fair election. Benin. I, I can go on and on and on. We have some great positive examples on the continent of Africa. I am not discouraged. We do have a few strong men who are left, but we're seeing the strong men. Can we men. get rid of them? Uh, that, <laughs> hopefully through the ballot. Hopefully through, look at Burkina Faso, where the people stood up and said, we want to have uh, a free and fair election. And we're not going to let the military take over. So after they push for change, they pushed, them, uh, they, they pushed hard against the military. And they had a great election in, in, in Burkina Faso. So it's going to be up to the people. It's not going to be up to us. We, our values and our policies are clear. There's not a country where we, if there are issues related to transitions and term limits, that we don't raise this as a, a concern uh, with these governments, both in private and as well uh, in public. Uh, our policies are clear on, on, on this issue. And I think that as uh, institutions develop and get stronger, uh, the need and the desire and the uh, ability for strong men to stay in power uh, will, uh, will diminish. And uh, it's unfortunate that it's always strong men uh, because we've had uh, an iron lady in, in uh, Liberia who uh, served as president uh, for two terms mm -hmm. and uh, is coming to the end of her second term and allowing for uh, an election to take place there has never been any discussion of a third term. Uh, we know that in Liberia in 2018 there will be a new president. And it's the first time in that country's history uh, that that's happened. And as I tell the Li Liberians, they have so much to be proud of. And they're like, oh, no. you." And I'm like, just look at your history. Uh, if they look at their history, uh, no time in our lifetime have they had a transition from one president to another one who had not died in office.
uh, one way or the other, or Charles Taylor, who went to jail. Uh, so they're going to have a historic moment to elect a new president and have a president step down and have an ex-president who stepped down voluntarily. And there are examples like that all around the continent. So if you guys can focus a little more of your attention. We <laughs> reported on Burkina Faso. Oh, good. And we even I said agree. that was, there were two women running for yeah. president for the first time. Good. Yeah. yeah. So yeah. that's the news we want to hear. <laughs> yes. Uh, regarding, I'm going to go back to trade a little bit. Uh, what is the US? I was at the um, forum on Wednesday, mm -hmm. and I had the opportunity of uh, talking to uh, participants outside. And one participant that came from Africa uh, attending the forum uh, mentioned that he went to the African Japan forum that took place two weeks before. I this. was there too. And he said it, it was a one week forum event, whereas the U.S. only dedicated one day. And that was a concern to him. And he also mentioned that what is the U.S. in, in regard to helping small, medium enterprise into the African market. You know, like, like, as you mentioned, in 2014, a lot of the bigger corporations invested in Africa. But what, I, what is the U.S. doing to support uh, medium and small enterprise to enter the African market? So in answer to your first question, all you saw was the business forum that took place on Wednesday. You did not see the intense engagements that started to take place even on the weekend. Uh, there were, uh, I attended a, a, a meeting of the uh, East African uh, heads of state uh, that looked at opportunities for business in East Africa. Uh, the Corporate Council on Africa was holding small forums with uh, presidents and, and, um, and business uh, 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 investors who were interested in those countries. BCIU was holding events as well. There were a lot of events around this business forum, and there are still um, um, contacts being made between uh, business uh, leaders and, uh, and some of the African heads of state. And as you know, on Monday, we will be hosting the AGOR Forum that will bring trade ministers to Washington, as well as business leaders to look at other opportunities for, uh, for enhancing uh, the opportunities that AGOA provides for duty-free import <laughs> of, uh, of um, items produced in Africa into the United States. As some of these participants are aware of this, uh, events also. I think they're participating in them. I mean, you couldn't, uh, for the East Africa event, uh, there, there was not uh, a ch an extra cheer in the room. Uh, there were people standing outside trying to get in. Uh, the, uh, some of them were invitation only. Uh, so businesses interested in doing business with Nigeria met with the trade minister of, uh, Nigeria? of Nigeria. Um, there were, uh, uh, opportunities uh, for Kenya. I don't even know them all myself. Uh, so it was uh, it was a very robust uh, week. But also our market is and, and our engagement uh, takes place regularly. Uh, we had the Global Entrepreneurship Summit in in, uh, in June in June in Kenya. So it's a regular engagement for us. Uh, the special events highlight what takes place all the time. Okay, well, that was a good question on Zimbabwe. President Robert Mugabe of Zimbabwe comes to the UN every year and calls for sanctions to be lifted. In fact, he described you as the United States, that is, as hegemonic and neo-imperialist. Um, can you articulate exactly how the sanctions work and, and to what extent they might be responsible for the current economic woes in that country? You know, the, the economic woes in Zimbabwe are a result of the policies of the Zimbabwean government. They are not a result of our sanctions. They are feeling the effects of the sanctions, and that's why uh, it's part of the uh, talking points uh, that President Mugabe and other leaders from Zimbabwe use, and they uh, uh, try to argue uh, uh, strongly that the sanctions are, are hurting our ordinary people. Uh, the sanctions are, are, are hurting um, the, those individuals who are involved in keeping this country from becoming um, uh, a modern and thriving uh, democracy. 
uh, that takes care of his people. Uh, the demonstrations that we have seen taking place in Zimbabwe are an expression of the discontent that people in this country have. Uh, I think there are uh, amazing opportunities uh, in that country. We have met uh, many of the young people who are uh, involved in education, in uh, business, uh, in civil society. Uh, it's uh, uh, some of them part of our Young African Leaders Initiative. Uh, seeing those young people, I have tremendous hope for uh, Zimbabwe's future, and I hope at some point uh, this country will transition uh, into uh, a country that is brought back into the community of democracies and uh, in which their economy is allowed to, uh, to flourish. I'm going to take one question from the back and then... So, thank you so much. My name is Malik Ken from Africa, Senegal. I uh, wanted to talk about the Simpson African American History and Culture Museum dedication for tomorrow. And, I, and I, I know that, you know, Senegal contributed by donating some artifacts. I uh, just wanted to emphasize on the cultural cooperation between the United States and Africa, between the two people, I mean, what kind of, you know, programs you're trying to develop culturally for Africa. You know, that cultural uh, bridge has always been there. Um, and uh, in fact, the reason I'm leaving here tonight is so that I can be at that museum when it opens up at 8 o'clock tomorrow morning with the uh, I, I actually did get a ticket. <laughs> My husband didn't get one, so he's going to be left outside. <laughs> uh, it's historic for us. It's uh, emotional uh, for, uh, uh, for us. Uh, I remember the first time I visited Senegal, yeah. and I went to Gory Island, and I'm standing there, and even I feel it even now, uh, that uh, uh, emotional feeling that this is where is many right. of us as African Americans started our journey uh, to uh, the United States against our, uh, yeah. against our will. Uh, and uh, the impact of that on the African American community uh, is still being felt. Uh, and so this museum is going to, for us, give us an opportunity to uh, uh, put our history out so people can see it. And so I would just thank Senegal and all of the other African countries, South Africa, and others who contributed to the museum that will help us help our children understand our history. Because uh, uh, it's very easy uh, for, uh, for people to forget our history. And the museum gives us uh, the historical opportunity to highlight that uh, tomorrow. So I'm going to be there with, uh, with bells on. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much.